Doink! What was that on your arm? A bee. Great. Not exactly a pleasant feeling. Painful, itchy, annoying, scary. We've all been there before. So, that happens because the bee jabs its barbed stinger into your skin and releases some venom. The venom contains proteins that cause pain and can affect your immune system and skin cells. But that's nothing compared to what the bee has to go through. Poor little thing. You'll be fine after a few hours, but the bee? Not so much. Honeybees don't usually sting people unless they feel threatened or if you accidentally step on them. The problem is that after stinging you, the bee can't pull its barbed stinger out of your skin. The only way to get free is to leave the stinger behind. The stinger though, not just a sweet defense mechanism, it also contains part of the bee's digestive tract, nerves, and muscles that are, unfortunately, essential for the bee to function normally. So, yep, after losing all that, this tiny creature doesn't survive. Yikes. Poor little bee. Apart from that, they're such cool animals. They have five eyes, two pairs of wings, and six legs. Bees have excellent survival instincts, and they've been around for a really long time. 130 million years and counting. Who knows what ancient species they've stung? Most bees in the hive are called worker bees, and the big cheese is called the queen. She lays around 2,000 eggs per day. Sound like a lot? Well, the average hive contains 50,000 bees, and they disappear after just one sting. I guess going through a painful and itchy experience doesn't actually sound that bad when you only have one bee on your arm. Imagine if you had the whole hive. It may seem like bees just aimlessly fly around or use their vision to decide where they go. But these cool insects are pretty organized and rely on a super complex transport system. Imagine planning a cross-country road trip, only this time there are no roads. I can't even make it to the gym without my GPS, or if I stop at a burger joint on the way there. But not bees, they're way cooler than us. They use bee lines. Well, I call them that. They're basically a series of insect pathways bees tend to follow through human towns or the countryside. These pathways link every existing wildlife area together. It's like a bee railway system. My favorite bee is the buff-tailed bumblebee. It has an oval-shaped body covered in dense hair and a brain the size of a poppy seed. Considering how small it is, that's really impressive. How smart are they? Scientists made an experiment where they trained a bunch of them to play bee soccer. They even learned how to score a goal in return for a sweet sugary treat. Unbelievable! These same bees have another amazing ability. They use their smelly footprints to distinguish between the scents of strangers, their own bee relatives. They can even recognize their own scent. Bumblebees, we know your dirty little secret. You have smelly feet. And then, there's the queen bee. She's unique in her colony, and her main task? Laying eggs. People often assume the queen is there to tell the other bees exactly what to do. Yeah, not really. She does have a certain influence. But even without her, the hive actually functions pretty well. Each bee has a job and knows its daily functions and tasks because of its instincts and the chemical signals it senses and uses. So, I guess no one needs to tell them how to behave. Those chemical signals are their way of communicating. Oh, and they know how to shake it. They wiggle their bodies at specific angles for a certain amount of time. That's how they send messages to each other. If something happens to the queen bee and she doesn't survive, worker bees create a new one. Yep, they don't find one, but sort of raise a new one. They choose a young larva and feed the future, Her Majesty, a special food called royal jelly. That lucky larva can now grow into the new queen. Bees are fast. They can beat their wings almost 200 times a second. Those eight push-ups I can do in a minute, not sounding so impressive. Each bee produces around one teaspoon of honey in its lifetime. To produce one pound of honey, bees have to fly the equivalent of one whole time around the globe. These hardworking animals make around 100 million trips to about 200 million flowers to collect enough nectar for that pound of honey. Honeybees sleep five to eight hours a day, and just like us, they rest at night. Their brains are pretty active when they're resting. Some scientists think they may be dreaming, also just like us. When winter rolls around, a lot of insects replace their body water with a special chemical called glycerol. It's a type of natural antifreeze that helps them stay alive in low temperatures. Bees, though, they just huddle together in the hive to stay toasty warm. All right, enough about bees. Let's whip around the animal kingdom looking for crazy facts. Bats could eat a thousand insects an hour if they were insanely hungry. They're the only mammal that can fly, and their bones are so thin, most of them can't even walk. Insects, for the most part, don't have ears on their heads. Instead, they have them all over their bodies. You know, scorpions are interesting little Ouch. creatures. Six legs, two claws, and a powerful stinger. Now, what if humans also wore exoskeletons to protect themselves? So an exoskeleton is mainly made up of chitin, which is a complex material found in insects and reptiles. 
Thanks to their exoskeletons, these tiny creatures can defend themselves and perform acts of superhuman strength. If you were a scorpion exoskeleton, you'd be able to climb up any building you wanted. With massive claws in the front, it would be easy to grab hold of things and even cut through them. Might be hard to open a bag of chips, though. But at night, you'd have problems – UV rays. They wouldn't hurt you or cut through you or anything, but you'd definitely glow in the dark. Not exactly ideal for sneaking up on someone. A scorpion's tail is venomous and packs a nasty sting. You could use it to sting anyone in your way. Plus, it's long enough that you could defend yourself from a safe distance. Scorpions live all over the world in some of the harshest environments, from freezing icy landscapes to scorching hot deserts. If it freezes, a scorpion can even thaw itself out under the sun. This next creature also has two claws and six legs, but it doesn't have a stinger. It's the mighty crab. Its shell is a lot more powerful than a scorpion's, and it's surprisingly quick. So you'd be seriously powerful in one of those. The downside is you'd only be able to walk sideways. And you'd be delicious to someone like me. There are almost 5,000 species of crab all over the world, each with special skills. In a crab costume, you'd definitely be a master digger. Sure, you'd be doing it sideways, but those legs and claws can get the job done. If there were crab-inspired bodysuits, they'd most likely be made for digging. You could even work underwater. You'd be agile, strong, and you'd look awesome. Humans in ant suits would dominate any construction site. Ants live in colonies around most of the world and rely on strength in numbers. But that doesn't mean each little ant's weak or anything, just the opposite. There are actually already exoskeleton suits out there to help humans do some heavy lifting. But to use the actual strength of an ant would be a game changer. An ant can lift around a thousand times its own weight. In a group, they can drag a bird across a field without breaking a sweat. What's even crazier is that they can carry things while they're climbing straight up a wall, or even upside down. Wow! Imagine a group of humans dragging a jet fighter up the side of the Empire State Building. There wouldn't be any need for bulldozers or cranes anymore. Just strap into an ant suit and get her done. Buildings could be inspired by those huge underground ant colonies. Ants are amazing at making tunnels. Imagine wearing a bodysuit that flies through the air like a stealth craft. If you wore a hornet suit, you'd have it made. They have a tough exoskeleton that's surprisingly light and easy to maneuver. Picture a fleet of strong flying acrobats. Oh, and don't forget the stinger. Most people think of hornets as pests, but they're not. They do a lot of good for the ecosystem, like eating up those pesky mosquitoes. Having a hornet suit would be essential for any kind of undercover work, not so much for office work. A strong aerodynamic bodysuit with a powerful stinger? Hey, sign me up! An armadillo uses keratin to make its bodysuit. You know, the stuff your hair and nails are made of? What makes it unique is that it's foldable and durable at the same time. It's made up of hexagon-shaped plates that go all over its back. When there's danger around, it can roll up into a ball. Scientists are studying how to make durable bending glass just like the armadillo's body plates. Humans wouldn't be 100% protected with this thing on, but they'd be able to withstand pretty much anything. You could jump out of a plane, no parachute, land on a rooftop, brush it off, roll off the edge, and land safely on a nearby car. All while being chased by tricked-out cars and helicopters. Nah, I've been streaming too many movies. Being one of the slowest animals on Earth does come with an advantage. You got a heavy shell on you 24-7 for protection. Just like armadillos, tortoise shells are made of keratin. What's sweet about its shell is that it grows with the tortoise. Crabs and other shelled animals have to keep replacing theirs as they outgrow them. Humans would be almost invincible if they wore tortoise suits, but they'd be insanely slow and draw a lot of attention. Still, if something goes down, you could just hide in your shell and wait it out. Hopping around from place to place would be pretty sweet, but what about flying? Grasshoppers can do both. They have a set of wings they tuck in behind them, which they unleash after their epic takeoff jump. Oh, and they come in all shapes and sizes, great for camouflage. Mosquitoes, bedbugs, fleas, beetles, gadflies, millions of insects out there can't wait to feast on the most delicious dessert, you.
especially if it's warm outside and you sweat a little. The good news is that not many bugs want to eat you. It's estimated that there are about 10 million species of insects in the world, and only 14,000 of them feed on your vital fluid. A few hundred among this group regularly bite people. Um, okay, yeah, it's still too many. But it wasn't always like that. In the distant past, insects didn't dare to attack huge animals for food. They developed their ability to feed on blood from 200 to 65 million years ago. And there are several theories why this happened. Imagine small beetles and insects living in the nest of some flying dinosaur or a giant ancient bird. They feed on bird secretions, rotten grass, mm, leaves, or mushrooms. Then a piece of skin or a feather of an animal falls on their table. Insects taste it, and they like it. Then a dinosaur arrives, and the beetles sense a familiar smell. They climb on its skin and bite it. Or they accidentally fall on an open sore of a bird and taste it. For insects, this would be the most delicious thing they had ever eaten. Yeah, I agree, it's a pretty low bar. Now, other insects have a long, thin feeding tube called a proboscis. They use it to feed on plant sap or other smaller insects. And now, one of these beetles sits on a wounded mammal and accidentally bites it. The beetle's body already has the right enzyme capable of digesting blood. So, from that moment on, the beetle doesn't want to eat anything other than red nectar. The beetle bears offspring, and it takes over the ability to feed on blood. Imagine you've been eating grass and leaves all your life, and then you try some sweet banana pudding. You wouldn't want to go back to eating good old grass now. You'd always want dessert. Insects had the same feeling when they tasted nutritious blood. Yumbo! One of the coolest theories says the thirst for blood in insects was caused by microbes. Blood isn't an ideal food for beetles. It doesn't have enough vitamins or nutrients for them. That's why a whole ecosystem of microorganisms had to form inside their intestines. These bacteria can synthesize some essential vitamins with the help of blood. These bacteria won't survive if they stop feeding on that red fluid. And when these bacteria disappear, insects have problems with development and reproduction. It's impossible to name the exact reason, since the transition from plant food to animal food happened a very long time ago. Since then, evolution has created a variety of ways to extract blood. The most famous blood-dependent species are, of course, mosquitoes. Only female mosquitoes need blood to produce eggs. When mosquitoes fly, they feel the heat, carbon dioxide, and lactic acid in the air. These smells attract the mosquitoes, so they fly to their source, an animal or a human. Then the mosquito lands on its prey and inserts its proboscis into the skin. At the same time, it secretes saliva to prevent clotting. The unpleasant skin sensation you get after the bite is an allergic reaction of your body to the mosquito saliva. Then the female produces eggs and leaves the larva in stagnant water. It could be a pond, a drain, or an outdoor pool. Small mosquitoes feed on organic substances in the water, then grow up and go on their first hunt. Black flies also feed on blood, but they don't do it as carefully as mosquitoes. The female black fly lands on the prey, uses its sharp jaws to cut the skin, and devours its lunch. Fortunately, they don't bother people too much. Their main target is livestock and wild animals. Horse flies and deer flies are the real human enemies. Their bite is quite painful. Ordinary flies that live on the street and inside human houses are super annoying and they can feast on your skin without even biting you. Everything they need from you lies on the surface. You secrete sweat, proteins, carbs, salts, sugar, and other chemicals that the fly collects with its proboscis. And of course, it hardly understands that you're a living being and don't want to share your food with it. That's why a fly isn't afraid of you. You probably notice that some people get bitten by insects more often than others. You could be going for a walk in the park, and they get all over you. But your friend walking right next to you wouldn't feel anything. Hey, just means you're a sweetie. Scientists used to believe that some people actually just don't feel it when they get bitten. Their body doesn't have such a strong reaction to mosquito saliva. But recent studies have shown the number of bites depends on genetics and many other factors. 
Around 10 to 20% of people are just more attractive to predatory insects. How lucky or unlucky are they? So you're at home enjoying your evening tea under a warm blanket when all of a sudden you see a huge, no, enormous mosquito. Its long and gangly legs have a span of your palm, and it clumsily bumps into all the obstacles it meets. Despite its awkward appearance, it's still terrifying. What if it carries malaria? What if it eats you alive in your sleep? Slowly, not to draw the monster's attention to yourself, you get out from your soft chair and run for it into the bathroom, lock yourself in there, and open the browser on your phone. After a few seconds, you draw a ragged breath of relief. Turns out, it's just a crane fly, not a mosquito at all. It might look like a ferocious beast, but it's actually peaceful and even defenseless. Many crane flies don't even have mouths, so they don't eat at all. And those that have a mouthpiece will only munch on sweet flower nectar. Crane flies are really clumsy in the air. Their rather short wings are no match for their huge bodies and long legs. So they're slow, and it's easy to catch them. Birds and frogs, as well as bats and cats, love them as a treat. The only way they can avoid being eaten is by losing a limb. Their legs easily break off even when nothing touches them. And if you're still unconvinced not to scram and set your house on fire when you see one, consider this. Crane flies can tell you if the water pool you're about to swim in is of good quality. If you see these bugs on or above the water, you're good to go. Even more, fishers often make their bait look like the crane fly larva. Ah, this makes it more appetizing for the fish. But while googling, you get engrossed with reading up on some other weird and crazy bugs. For example, here's the human face stink bug. Nah, they don't really stink, at least for humans. They give off pheromones that attract other stink bugs, letting them know there's food nearby. The most peculiar feature of it is in the name. A man face stink bug has a face on its back with three black dots drawn in red. The vibrant color of its back warns predators that the bug isn't tasty or even poisonous, while the black eyes draw attention from them to the vulnerable head. Saddleback caterpillar's name is also quite telling. It looks like some creature from another planet with a bright green saddle over its back. And the saddle is, sadly, the only safe part of the thing to touch. The spines you see all over the rest of its body are sharp and highly poisonous. If you want to give it a friendly tap on the back, make sure you don't touch anything else. Well, well, we have a titan beetle next. Meet the largest beetle in the whole world. It can grow as long as your entire palm, complete with fingers. Seeing one in the wild can be a shocking experience, especially if it flies right in your face. But don't fret. Thankfully, this giant is placid and won't bite you if you don't mean it harm. Still, if you make it angry, never let its mandibles touch you. The bug will hiss and bite, and what such snap can crack a pencil in half. What's interesting, an adult titan beetle doesn't feed at all. It doesn't need food to survive. As a larva, it gets enough energy to keep it well-nourished even when grown up. Ooh, I love <laughs> that ability. An even more menacing-looking bug is a giant weeda. Living in New Zealand, these cricket-like creatures look like someone forgot to lock the portal to the infernal. A massive, beefy body with six thorny legs, long alien-looking antennae, and big mandibles that just might cut steel. Well, in fact, these giant insects are quite peaceful and won't bite unless provoked. And even if they do, it's not as bad as you might think. There are videos with weedas biting hands of people holding them and doing no harm at all. So don't let it scare you, even though such an insect might weigh more than a full-fledged sparrow. Atlas moths look like they have three heads, two of which are serpents. These pretty nocturnal flyers have strange shapes on the tips of their wings that look like snakeheads. This seems to be their mode of defense from predators. And that's also why they're sometimes called cobra moths. In Southeast Asia and India, where they normally dwell, atlas moths are often found on butterfly farms producing silk. And that's some sight. The wingspan of one such moth can reach 10 inches. That's larger than your hand. Peacock spiders are perhaps the cutest arachnids in the world. 
second maybe only to their jumping cousins. They're so tiny, you probably wouldn't even notice one scrambling through your kitchen. But if you get a chance to take a closer look, do it. Peacock spiders are beautiful. They have large beady eyes, a shiny blue and red coat, and cute fuzz on their body and legs. And their mating dance is something else entirely. Too bad they only live in Australia. Another moth on the list, the hummingbird moth. Remember the atlas one, how huge it was? Well, this one's as big as a hummingbird and holds much more resemblance to its namesake than that. The speed at which it flutters its wings, the long tongue to drink flower nectar, and even the sound it makes when flying, all of it makes you wonder if it's really a moth after all. Of course, the fuzzy critter is absolutely safe, and you should consider yourself lucky if you ever see one. That's it for today. So hey, if you pacified your curiosity, then give the video a like and share it with your friends. Or if you want more, just click on these videos and stay on the bright side.